Tales, the Luciferian Outlaw, Lance Legion, the Asmus, here once again, and this is going to be another long-form video that is done for the purpose of what I mentioned in my last video about rebranding my upcoming book in a way that's more unique to my own brand and going further with the ideas of neo-nihilism and power nihilism and to my own mercenary nihilism or Midist nihilism along with the more occult and spiritual aspects that are Luciferian nihilism. A lot of people, well, those that have read, have told me that they think that my text is very spiritual in an occult way, and, you know, I would agree with that. It is. It is a very much an occult text. It's like the arcane secrets and ideas that are discoverable only to those who are able to understand them. So that would definitely be the case. And like I said, my book is being rebranded. The ebook that I sent out to fans, a few fans that asked and all that, that is nowhere near the final text. That is a prototype. The final version will not be an ebook. It will be a hard copy book, and it will be quite a bit different than what you have now. Uh, the same ideas will be discussed and all that, but rearranged slightly. Some things have been reworded, rearranged, and expanded. A new chapter has been added. So, this will be a long one. It is four a.m. where I'm at right now, but I'm fucking wide awake, and we're gonna pop a brew here, and I am going to give another reading and another speech. It's going to be similar to the ones I've done in the past. In fact, some of it is straight up copy and pasted from my previous speeches, but it's condensed down into one thing. My previous speech on mercenary nihilism mixed with one of my last, more recent videos on Midas nihilism into mercenary Midas nihilism. But repetition is what gets things done. I don't mind repeating myself. And even if this video will be repetitive, that's a good thing in my view because it's repetition repeating in the mind that eventually convinces the mind. So none of this like wannabe Billy badassery of I don't need to repeat myself. Well guess what? If you don't, I think you're selling yourself short. So this will be a long video. So strap in and like I said I am reiterating things I've said in the past. I'm acknowledging that. But I'm repeating myself. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, so all this is just, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, without further ado, let's get started. In the current age of convictionist dogma of religious socio-politicalisms, the antinomian grows tired of the crisis of herd animals and the self-righteous indignation of delusional moralists. In this epoch of political superstition and omnipresent chastising from slave morality multitudes, the renegade philosopher wishes to raise his broad axe and split open the phantasmic, illusion-ridden skull of all societal and ethical creeds. Myself, being of this anti-moral and anti-political disposition, finds it pertinent to make a proclamation against the self-righteousness regarding ethics and convictions. I shall seek to stop the presumptive notions of the moral objectivists dead in their tracks by offering the darkly honest and grimly realist 
worldview to which a truly liberated mind would undertake. Such a morbid Weltanschauung is not humanism, liberalism, conservatism, socialism, fascism, communism, nor libertarianism as such. Nor is it the anarcho-socialism of the political nihilists of the 19th century. This worldview is the cold observation that power and might are how we achieve our goals, accentuate our desires, and attain apotheosis of body, spirit, and mind. Behind this power and might is a will, a will to power, the will itself being a form of might. Some may think that just because someone possesses within them this quality called conviction, meaning that they are steadfast, relentless, and uncompromising in their beliefs, means that they hold a powerful will. But as Nietzsche declared, convictions are more poisonous enemies of truth than lies. Most people's convictions, which they hold too oh so psychotically, are based on misapprehensions, misjudgments, and misinterpretations. They are under the false notion that their beliefs are objective, binding, absolute, and that there exist objective moral values and duties. This is a falsehood, an illusion, a phantom, and a phantasm, a spook. A more willful, powerful, and mightier force does not heed your convictions. Moreover, even if your beliefs were facts, these facts would not entail that one ought to follow them, for the fact would not be applicable to all. You do not need to follow them. To hearken back to Nietzsche, there are no moral facts whatever, only misinterpretations. For as Nietzsche proclaimed in Twilight of the Idols, morality is nothing more than an interpretation of certain phenomena. More precisely, a misinterpretation. Just because you have conviction that you are right, doesn't mean you are in the right in noumenal reality. Even if you were right, it doesn't mean you will be victorious. Your convictions end where a more willful and powerful force begins. Only power decides outcomes in any given battle or situation, not self-righteousness, honor, or reason. No being, whether this being be human, beast, animal, or deity is immune to force. Even a king, queen, god, or goddess exists under the willful might of barrel, blade, or inferno. Nothing is impervious to might. This is what is meant by the phrase, might is right. This sets the basis for another qualified form of nihilism, a subset of neo-nihilism, power nihilism, and mercenary nihilism. Mercenary Midas nihilism. To recap the specifics of nihilism once again in the context of Midas nihilism, nihilism means that there exist no objective morals, no absolute good nor evil, no inherent moral right or wrong. This is not relativism, for relativists see themselves as virtuous defenders of society peering from the moral pedestal. Relativists argue that we ought not to criticize other people or other cultures because all cultures are valid, but this itself is a moral prescription of how one ought to behave. Thus, neo-nihilism rejects this because the prescription one ought not criticize other cultures is not a universal moral imperative. In this sense, it is essential to understand the difference between prescriptive and descriptive ethics. 
descriptive ethics describes certain behaviors of humans and other species amongst themselves. For example, one can describe the compassion and aggression amongst mankind. When one is describing a behavior, this does not logically entail that one prescribes, condemns, or condones that behavior. One would merely be stating facts and describing what is, not what ought or ought not be. Prescriptive ethics is an attempt to declare how one ought to or ought not to behave. Prescriptive ethics prescribes certain behaviors that others ought to engage in, such as one ought to do this or that. The Scottish philosopher David Hume observed that it is logically impossible to derive prescriptive ethics from descriptive ethics. It is logically impossible to derive universal moral prescriptions from descriptive facts. It is logically impossible to derive an ought prescription from an is description. This is known as Hume's guillotine. One cannot derive a universal moral value from a descriptive fact. It may be true that we have evolved the characteristic of compassion, but from this fact we cannot derive the universal moral prescription that one ought to be compassionate. Such a transgression of logic is as invalid as asserting that one ought to be cold-hearted from the fact that we have evolved cold-heartedness. Therefore, morality is not based on reason, but on sentiment, which is conditioned by both culture and biology. As Hume famously declared, "'Tis not contrary to reason to prefer the destruction of the whole world to the scratching of my finger." From a mercenary nihilist worldview, it is not contrary to reason. It's just highly unusual, given the evolution of the human species. To those who assert that we have an innate morality within us that tells us what is good from what is evil, the Midas nihilist points out that it may be a fact that we have the characteristics of compassion, empathy, altruism, and such. But these are universal characteristics, not universal values. Different cultures value different characteristics. For example, the characteristic of pride was a high value for the ancient Greeks, but was a vice for Christianity, as the medieval Christians considered it to be one of the seven deadly sins. The Vikings valued mercilessness in battle as the way to reach Valhalla, their paradise. Plato considered compassion to be a cowardly vice. The characteristics of pride, compassion, cold-bloodedness, and mercilessness are facts. But it is culture, not logic, that decides whether or not they are values. Morals do not progress or retrogress. They simply change given the subjects who value or disvalue certain characteristics as virtues or vices. When one describes natural instincts, one is merely describing facts, but nature cannot prescribe values. We have evolved both compassion and cold-bloodedness. Natural evolution cannot tell us which of these we ought to value more. We have evolved compassion, empathy, love, and altruism to aid in our survival, but we have also evolved the characteristics of mercilessness, anger, manipulation, hatred, and sociopathy that have also aided not only in our survival, but also our ability to gain power. The valuations of any of these qualities would be subjective, not objective. An ought can only come from an if. 
and ought can never come from it is. Therefore, moral imperatives are vacuous, and only strategic imperatives are viable. If I want X, then I ought to do Y. If I want to avoid consequence B, then I ought not do action C. An empirical judgment is not a value judgment. A strategic judgment is not a moral judgment. The theist is one who derives their moral values and duties from the existence of a god, whichever god that may be. But even if a god were to exist, this would simply be a quantitative statement about reality. We could still not derive objective moral values and duties from the fact of God's existence. This would be an is-ought fallacy, Hume's guillotine. One can simply recall the old Euphifro dilemma. Are things good because God commands them, or does God command things because they are good? If God commands things because they are good, then God is not all-powerful because there would be something outside of God which determined objective moral values and duties. If things are good because God commands them, then morality is merely based on the subjective sentiment of this God-mind. This God-mind, were to it exist, still cannot will objective moral values and duties into existence. To call this morality objective would be an illusion because it consists of nothing more than the capricious whims of a celestial dictator. Furthermore, valuations are products of minds, products of the subject, and are inherently subjective. God would be nothing more than a, another mind enacting its own subjective meaning, morality, and purpose. Whether or not God exists is irrelevant to whether or not objective moral values and duties exist. At the very best, one can simply say, if I don't want to face punishment in hell, then I ought to obey God. But to put it in Kant's terms, this is merely a hypothetical imperative, not a universal moral imperative. It does not bridge the is-ought gap, which has to do with prescriptive ethics. Objective values cannot be derived from objective facts. Only subjective values can be derived from facts. That is, an ought can only come from an if. An ought can never be logically derived from an is. Many atheists love to claim that they have liberated themselves from the shackles of authoritarian dictates. This is nonsense. However, they have only done so in terms of religion, for they still cling to a belief, a blind faith, and objective morality. This is just as irrational as having faith in a god or a religion. For them, this belief in objective morality often leads to strict adherence to political ideologies, such as communism and socialism, where subjective valuations as equality, conformity, and doing things for, for the greater good are presupposed as universal values. But this is circular reasoning as it presupposes equality and compassion as values from which further values are derived. Like the religious zealots before them, the dogmatic proponents of these ideologies use authoritarian means to enforce their valuations on others. All politics is nothing more than a person or group using the violence of the state or the collective to force their subjective valuations onto others. As Peter Shostad H. has said, we are not above the violence of the brutes because we know morality. Rather, we are above the brutes because we use the violence that is morality. It is indeed true that the church is the idol of the priestly parasite, 
and the state collective herd morality, herd mentality, herd slave morals, all these types of things, indeed, you know, are considered a greater good. These are the morally dogmatic ideals of the political parasite. One may have discarded faith in religion, but faith in objective morality is just as irrational, oftentimes more so. Logically speaking, one can place faith in a god without believing the commands of that god to be objective, absolute, or binding, but he who still wishes to espouse notions of objective moral values and duties after discarding faith in religion is nothing more than a bitter clinger. Nihilism per se, in the classical sense, is incongruent with human nature. It is true that we humans value things, whatever they may be. Mercenary nihilism refines the classical nihilist worldview into something more pragmatic. Mercenary nihilism does not denote meaninglessness of all things. Rather, it states that moral and political belief systems have no objective or universal truth value. They are merely in the subjective power interest of those that espouse them. For as Redbeard once observed, the infamous Ragnar Redbeard, belief is a war stratagem, an instrument of deceit, a convenient falsification formula, a beautiful hoodwink. Nihilism is simply stating that there are no universal facts, morals, values, or communications, only interpretations, perspectives, and misapprehensions. Thus, when a person commands another person to behave in a certain manner, such prescriptions are never universally binding facts, only morally subjective power imperatives. The term mercenary, as it is used here, refers to someone who is primarily concerned with advancing their own interests and goals, regardless of the subjective ethics of conformist masses. To paraphrase Herbert Spencer, the greatest socio-political superstition of old times was the so-called divine right of kings. And the greatest socio-political superstition of modern times is the implied and assumed divine right of majorities. One's ideology is ultimately one's morality, so morals are at the core of all socio-political belief systems. Normative morality is a tool for power. It may be a fact that the adherents of such faiths are acting in their own self-interests, but they are doing so under the assumptions that these values are objective and binding which is the fatal flaw of all political adherents. Such adherents are loyal to societal falsehoods. A mercenary Midas nihilist has no loyalties to socio-political or religious dogma, only interests. Furthermore, there is no way of proving natural rights to be true outside of countries, societies, civilizations, and communities, such notions are absurd. There are no inherent rights, only those which can be asserted by might and power in a strategic sense. This is what is meant by the phrase, might is right. The term mightest as it is used here, means one who recognizes that power, force, ability, skill, or might and will are the means by which we accentuate our desires and achieve our goals. 
one has a will to power, a will to might, to acquire more power, more might, and use said might to get more might, more power, not to merely survive, but to thrive. Mightism is also realizing that one's convictions do not matter when faced against a mightier force, and your sense of justice and being in the right is utterly meaningless and impotent when the blade is at your throat and is wielded by a warrior of a stronger and mightier will. Honor, morality, justice, law, some unwritten rule of reciprocity and social contractarianism, feelings, beliefs, ideologies, status, none of these things will prevent a more capable or willful force from annihilating you. Might is right and mightiness is merciless. Ideological adherents like to believe that they are in the right, that they are in control, that their morality is the universally correct one, that they are always on the morally right side of history, but sometimes this notion is challenged, and as a result, people are reduced to incoherent hysterics. The ones getting dominated always feel as though it's unfair. Here is a dose of realpolitik. There is no inherent fairness or justice. There are only those with the will and might to win. There are no inherent rights. There is only might. Equality is not an objective, prescriptive fact. It is only an objective, descriptive fact in mathematics. There is no honor, morality, or justice in struggles for power. There are only the victors and the vanquished. They evictus. Blessed are the pragmatically bold and merciless, for their will to power shall own the world. If you don't like being conquered, then develop a stronger will to conquer your conquerors. It is, you know, like this. In the amoral world of war, if one wishes to persevere, he must learn to value self-preservation, vengeance, and will to power more than honor, morality, or justice. Don't expect a fair and just war just because you aren't willing to get your hands dirty and blades bloody. Perhaps an even further amending of might is right can be pertinent here. Force and rhetoric all too often overpower reasoned argument. Even if one feels or knows they are totally in the right, on any personal or ideological issue, one might not be victorious against their opponent. Moreover, even if an individual's convictions were facts, such an observation would not entail that one ought to follow such a fact. Again, there are no universally binding facts, only interpretations. There are no binding imperatives, only perspectives of power. People will simply interpret facts in whatever way that suits their own goals of power. One may feel like they have a right to life or a right to enforce their beliefs on others due to the so-called fact that they believe their views are objective, absolute, and binding. We see this with those who adhere to any and all religious or political ideologies. When their progress is imposing their will on others, it is met with superior resistance or attack, whether the attack be offensive, defensive, or a counterattack. 
the purveyors of morality may feel that the other side is wrong, and if the other side overpowers them through superior speech, tactics, strategy, rhetoric, firepower, warfare, or even brute strength, the defeated may cry out how unfair such an occurrence is. They feel that it is unfair because they truly believe they are on the right side of history. Their will to power may be enacting a world in which their views can be lived by, a society in which their views are the dominant views, though indeed their will has been conquered by a superior will. For life is indeed will to power, but mightier will shall dominate others, regardless and irrespective of the convictions of the moralist. To reiterate Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil, now if someone can see through the cloddish simplicity of this famous free will and eliminate it from his mind, I would then ask him to take his enlightenment a step further and likewise eliminate unfree will in conformity with the prevalent mechanistic foolishness that pushes and tugs. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, it is only a matter of strong or weak wills. Furthermore, to hearken back to Benjamin de Cassier's cosmic nihilist. As Nietzsche has pointed out, our rights are our mights. That is, the thing we have the power to do, if there go along with it the power to immunize oneself from penalty, we do, in fact, must do. The obstacles that stand in the path of my inexorable attractions must die or else slay me. It is merely a question of which is the stronger, not whose is the trespass. Strength and strength's will is the supreme ethic, but it is no more moral than gravitation or the centrifugal and centripetal forces that preserve the orbit of the planet. It is a mechanical law with social implications. No two men's environments are the same because no two men's mental states are the same. Environment is a series of mental states superposed on a hypothetical world. Environment is not the sum of the forces which surround you, but the sum of the illusions which fire your brain. All suffering is caused by an obstacle in the path of a force. See that you are not your own obstacle. Humanity cannot escape its origins. It admires force more than goodness. It will applaud power unallied to moral principles, but never moral principles unallied to power. It loves the bold, though the bold be bad. When society no longer exists for the welfare of the individual, both must go. But the individual will be the last to disappear, because he was the first to appear. Hence, to live for others to the exclusion of self tends to the annihilation of both. But to live for self to the exclusion of others does not necessarily tend to the annihilation of both the individual and society. For it is easier to conceive of the existence of a single individual without society than it is to conceive of society without a single individual. Wherever justice has righted a wrong, it has wronged a right. Whatever exists tends naturally to individualize itself. The ideal, which is always anti-biological, tends to destroy this natural law. It substitutes you ought for I will. Unless the ought is self-evolved, I smash it. And reiterate in the face of all opposition 
to the extent of my power and courage. I will. There are no rights. There is only a war of mights. Right is the utilitarian application of might. Benjamin de Cassiers, ladies and gentlemen. And finally, in the cold declaration of one Max Stirner, I decide whether it is the right in me. Outside me, there is no right. If it is right for me, then it is right. Possibly, this won't make it right for others. That's their problem, not mine. They may defend themselves. The bottom line is that rights themselves are mere mental fabrications, you see. Legal rights are nothing more than what primates with superior might allow other primates to do. Moral rights, or natural rights, are nothing more than subjective human expectations. Rights are not inherent. But even if they were, a mightier will or force will eschew such interpretations and annihilate whatever stands in its path in the pursuit of its power. Psychotic convictions and indignant bombast are impotent in the face of a mightier force. And this mightier force cares not for the value, conviction, honor, cockiness, confidence, self-assuredness, or heart of its opponent, regardless of, you know, if such an opponent is justified or not. Thus, might is right can evolve once more into the cosmic grimness of the real realism. Might annihilates right, as Redbeard once proclaimed, and I'll say it again, because I quoted it earlier. Belief is a war stratagem, an instrument of deceit, a convenient falsification formula, a beautiful hoodwink. This forms the basis for mercenary Midas nihilism. Following this understanding, one may choose to operate in this natural world of war in a way that advances their own subjective valuations, thus becoming a mercenary Midas nihilist. This is not a moral imperative, but rather a strategic imperative. The characteristic of selfishness exists within all living beings. For each living being has its own will to power. Self-preservation may be the highest law, but this also encompasses the desire to advance, grow, gain, and maintain power. If one wishes to aid others, this is itself a selfish act, for watching those whom one values advance is a form of self-satisfaction. Likewise, one can say, you wanting me to abnegate and sacrifice myself for the betterment of you and yours is no less selfish than me wanting to preserve and advance my own values. Societal pressures and ramblings of a greater good are mere phantoms of the mind. No one is objectively morally bound to obey anyone or anything. At best, one can say if one does not wish to bring undesired consequences upon oneself, then one ought not perform certain actions. But if one is not fearful of such consequences in his will to power, then there is no reason nor conscience to stop him in his quest for apotheosis. There is no universal reason that one ought to be compassionate towards one's enemies. This does not mean that one must deal with such rivals in an extreme manner. One can deal with adversaries in a crafty manner. 
Empress Sun Tzu once advised, all warfare is based on deception. Adherents of certain ideological persuasions seem to look to history to suggest that since some people have endured oppression in past times, that some people in the modern world should suffer social consequences in the name of justice. Even if the historical oppression were a fact, it would not entail that one ought to derive a universal value of justice from this fact. Facts do not lead to moral values. As morality is subjective, there can be no justice in an objective sense. There is only personal vengeance. Vengeance is based on one's own subjective perceptions and values. From any kind of nihilistic point of view, it may not have been immoral for someone to transgress against another, but it is also not immoral for the transgressed to seek vengeance against someone who has affected him in a way that he finds undesirable. The mercenary Midas Nihilist would value vengeance against anyone who would tread upon him in the name of social justice. Might annihilates right, is lex naturalis as well as lex talionis. If we want to be logical, we would assert ourselves based on our own individual perceptions subjective goals, prefer preferences, and values while being conscious of this fact. This is realpolitik. Justice is based on the notion of a herd morality that believes in objective moral values and duties. But as there is no objective morality and no inherent purpose to life, the concept of justice is nothing more than the arbitrary notions of slavish mob moralists who falsely believe that their worldview is objective and binding. Moral nihilism contends that justice is false because it is based on notions of objective moral values and duties. But vengeance is exacted by someone who feels their own self-preservation has been tread upon. The treading is not objectively wrong, but if tread upon under the falsehood of social justice, subjectively the mercenary nihilist may retaliate based on a notion of will to power and might is right, declaring a dictum of tread not on me. The exacting of vengeance is not objectively right or wrong. It would merely be a fact of an individual's might and will asserting itself. Moral nihilism doesn't justify anything. It contends that there is no such thing as objective justification in the first place. There is no objective moral right. There is only the will to power of might. Adherents of justice may claim that justice helps achieve peace, stability, and balance in society, but this assumes what it seeks to prove. It begs the question, as it values justice from which further conformist values are derived. As objective morality is illusion, moral justice can have no objective ground. The phantom of Lady Justice lies headless under the merciless blade of Hume's guillotine. Only the warrior of individual vengeance remains. There is no absolute justice, only perspectives. There are facts, but there are no universal interpretations or perspectives. There are no moral facts only misinterpretations. There are no objectively binding facts, only interpretations. Purge yourself of moral interpretations of the world. 
for there exists only the will to do something, the power, might, and ability to do something, and the remorselessness, shamelessness, and mercilessness to do something. And asserted right is taken, not given. Equality is not an objective prescriptive fact. It is only an objective descriptive fact in mathematics, as I said earlier. For as Nietzsche pointed out, true equality is never attained because as soon as crusaders of equality believe they achieve the phantom of equality, they will immediately seek to overpower others. Redbeard pointedly observed that even if equality before the law, or even equality before the law, is a contradiction in terms, because law itself is an incarnation of inequality, it is nothing more than an arbitrary, insolent imposition. For as Redbeard famously stated, it is true that all who obey the law are equally the servants of those who made it or caused it to be made. Therefore, equality is never the goal. The goal is always domination and impunity over other organisms and the attainment of power. Moral principles, such as the specter of equality, are one of the tricks in the game of dog-eat-dog, -dog, all are playing. The true mercenary Midas Nihilist realizes this and acts accordingly to his own interests. The mercenary Midas Nihilist is driven by a will to power to enact his own personal ends, whatever they may be. What separates the mercenary Midas Nihilist from socio-political herd morality is that he is not under a misapprehension of objective morals. He will simply do what benefits himself and who or what he subjectively values, irrespective and regardless of the moral dogma of the masses. He has no fear of what the world will say or how he will be judged by the morals of the multitude, for objective morality is an illusion, and like the politics and religions of which it permeates, is nothing more than a means to control others. Having this knowledge, he may use sinister means to achieve his ends if need be, and has no loyalty to any socio-political ideology, creed, or system, only what benefits his own values. He understands that the best defense against the treacherous is treachery. He can value loyalty, but only when it is reciprocated in a beneficial way. Tactically, he does not value giving free speech to those who would not reciprocate such a courtesy. His views of the Constitution are reminiscent of Lysander Spooner's take. But whether the Constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain that it has either authorized such a government as we have had, or it has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. That is, one may value the Constitution, but in a world where might is right, and might annihilates right, and mightiness is merciless, one cannot appeal to it by using its rhetoric to defeat an enemy who does not value its philosophical underpinnings. All organisms seek to dominate, gain power over others, nothing more. For as Nietzsche said in Beyond Good and Evil, life itself, in its essence, means appropriating, injuring, overpowering those foreign and weaker, oppression, harshness, forcing one's own forms on others, 
incorporation and at the very least and the very mildest exploitation life simply is the will to power and a certain right is taken not given equality is not an objective prescriptive fact again for as Nietzsche pointed out true equality is never attained because as soon as crusaders of equality believe they have achieved the phantom of equality they will immediately seek to overpower others the mercenary nihilists cast down any notions of social justice for the values of societal justice can only be assumed they are not universal objective or binding Thus, they can also be rejected outright. He also rejects any demands of conformity from those who espouse any pretensions of blood and soil. For these pretensions are based on reified abstractions that are also without universal foundation. The cultural valuations of all political ideologies are subjective, not objective. Is he, if he is called selfish, the mercenary Midas Nihilus cares not for this judgment, for there is no moral reason why he ought not seek out his own will to power. He realizes if he does not slither craftily, observe patiently, and strike mercilessly, then he himself will be tread upon. In a war, neither side's conflicting desires are objective or binding, only contingent upon who has the most might and will to achieve power. Thus, the mercenary Midas Nihilus rejects the false prophets of the false gods of socialism, capitalism, communism, fascism, feminism, nationalism, inherent human and animal rights, environmental ethics, justice, law, democracy, anarchism, and all other groundless ideological phantoms. The mercenary Midas Nihilus perhaps would paraphrase Ragnar Redbeard by declaring before none of your false or printed idols do I bend an acquiescence in the being who saith thou shalt obey kneel before me to me as my mortal foe all ethics politics and ideologies are pure assumptions built upon assumptions they rest on no sure foundation no moral dogma must be taken for granted no standard of measurement deified no slave value idolized there is nothing inherently sacred about moral codes like the wooden idols of long ago they are all the work of human hands and what man has made man can destroy the truly free man is a warrior who is born free, lives free, and dies free. He is, even though living in an artificial civilization, above all laws, all constitutions, all theories of right and wrong. He supports and defends them, of course, as long as they suit his own end, but if they don't, then he annihilates them by the easiest and most direct method. Might is right, absolutely, unreservedly, mercilessly. As might is right, mightiness is merciless. Then might annihilates right. The truly mighty serve no master but their own will to power, that is, their own will to might. If you've stuck with it this long, much appreciated. As I like to be thorough, as you know, and this was a long-form discussion, we might call it the Mercenary Midas Nihilus Power Hour, if you will. Yeah, the, mercy, the Mercenary Midas Nihilist Hour, for sure.
as always, thanks for watching and listening. I'll see you in the next video. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the Luciferian outlaw into dark triumph ride. Ave.